For the majority of the 13 year history of this show, I have said at some point in every single Lexus episode, I'm not a Lexus guy, but, so here goes nothing. I'm not a Lexus guy, but I bought one. Admittedly, I'm still surprised about this whole turn of events as you are, so let's go through what it is, how it happened, why I feel this car is important, and then move on to an experience that I didn't quite expect that is part of this whole purchase. So what is it? It's a 2021 Lexus LC 500 convertible. Yes, it is the very car that we featured in the tech review and the full first drive review of this car, what, in summer of 2020. And admittedly, I was smitten with that car. You saw my face in that episode. Yeah, it's the sound, but it's more the design. And what you guys may not know about me, I am a big Japanese sports car fan. I've owned an RX-7, I've owned a Supra. The only one I haven't owned is a Z32 300ZX. I will own one at some point in my life. And to me, I see this as the real spiritual successor to a Supra, because if you look at the last real Supra that was made 100% by Toyota, that, that's not a sports car, that's more of a GT car which this is. And I feel it's a bookmark in the history of Toyota as well as Japanese cars that are unique. This will be the last rear wheel drive, naturally aspirated V8, full stop. That's what's interesting to me about this car. If you remember my episode with Kevin, he's the man that runs the Calty Design Studio here in California where this car was designed. He told us the story of how this car came about. It wasn't something like, hey, we're gonna build a Lexus or a Toyota GT car. He just came up with a sketch, something that was achingly beautiful, that frankly wasn't even meant for a car show stand. And then the sketch made the rounds at Toyota and the design was so stunningly beautiful, it moved the powers that be at Toyota to make it into a real production car when there wasn't a platform to put it on. The only thing they had was that naturally aspirated five liter engine and brings us to the company behind it, Toyota. I have told you guys in many episodes, Toyota is different than other car manufacturers because they're the richest car manufacturer on the planet. They have more money in the bank than other car manufacturers that is unencumbered. And as such, they can put a crap ton of money into research and development for electrification. They can put it into trucks that aren't sold in certain regions of the world, or they could put it into crossovers. But in this case, they put a lot of money into something they knew they wouldn't get a hell of a lot of return on. They never thought they were gonna sell a lot of these things. They knew they were gonna be expensive and they knew it wasn't just about the design. It was also about the tactile feel because frankly, everything feels better than you get in some Porsches or a Mercedes. Like right now I'm driving an S500, magnificent car. It's a $130,000 base price. That is about $15,000 more than this car costs. And that certain parts of the interior are not nearly as good as this. They also took some detailing to make the interior its own. It's not like the Russian nesting dolls of other Lexus just made bigger or more fancy for a convertible. Like you look at the HVAC system, it has stunning toggle switches that have been adapted to 2021. Then we gotta get to, well, how did the whole thing come about? It's not like I called up Toyota and I said, hey man, you know, I want an LC500. Now for the avoidance of doubt, uh, I did not buy this car at a Toyota dealership. It was the car we featured on the episode. So I bought it directly from Toyota Motor Sales uh, US. So it didn't go through a dealer. Uh, and I didn't say, hey, you know, can I buy that car? I was nagging him for it. It just came through a discussion I had with a buddy of mine, actually one of the guys who runs the fleet companies that delivers these cars to us. So yeah, all the cars are owned by the manufacturer, but there are like three or four fleet companies around the country that manage the fleets and deliver the cars to people like me. 
And he had just gotten a Toyota, he got a Land Cruiser. And I was like, you know what? I'd really like a Land Cruiser. And he's like, sorry, buddy, I got the last one. Nah, 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 nah. So I just started scratching my head. And then what, about a month later, my contact at Toyota calls me and she goes, I hear you're jealous about uh, your friend's Land Cruiser. I'm like, hell yeah, I want a Land Cruiser. She goes, sorry, we got none. But anything else you're interested in? You know what? I don't want to cross over. And as much as I like an 86, I didn't want something like that. She goes, how about a Lexus? I'm like, mm, not really. And then she's like, really? You went on and on about that LC500 convertible. I'm like, well, if one happens to pop up, a month later, this one popped up. So there's the story. And now, speaking of Toyota North America, let's literally shift gears here. Um, we're not going to do the whole review with this car because we already did it. But we're going to do something that you and I have yet to do with this car. So um, let's go to Texas and do that. Okay, so you and I have already done this before, but a recap, 4,540 pounds, or depending on express your weights and measures, 2,063 kilograms. With that, not a track car, on a track specifically, Eagles Canyon outside of Dallas. This is a lovely little track in that there's elevation changes, and I, whoa, a little bit more technical. Not the exact car you want for this track. Now the thing that absolutely stands out here is that engine. It is magnificent. Not just the sound, the power delivery here because you're not waiting for turbos to spool up. So this works incredibly well. I would argue the transmission not ideal for this application. Granted, I want to do some downshifts here and it denies me every once in a while. Uh, the steering, it's a GT car. <laughs> Really, we shouldn't really be arguing about this steering here because it's not designed to do this, but man oh man, Lexus has got balls the size of pumpkins to put not just an LC500, but the convertible on the track here for us mooks to drive here. And this is a great experience for me personally because, you know, I wrote a check for that car because it's just stunningly beautiful. I would argue it's Calti's seminal work, but this, it's, it doesn't embarrass itself here on the track. Like you would think a big luxury GT would be all over, the weight would be everywhere. But here, we got a lovely chicane here, obviously denied downshift, but I'm able to do this and not embarrass myself. And they put that there for the event because we're driving everything from LC500s down to 86s and they're trying to slow people down. But overall, the experience, really what's the lesson we've learned here in taking a very large, almost 5,000 pound convertible out on a track. Uh, the bones are there, the dynamics are there. It's more than just a pretty face. Okay, so back in the California Republic and you thought I was gonna drop a bombshell on you like this and not play a round of the options game with my own personal car. So with that, let's dive right into it, even though this is a rehash of the one we already did back in the summer of 2020. 2021 Lexus LC 500 convertible for a base price of $101,000. To that, we add the color, and to me, there is only one color on this car, infrared. It's a burgundy, but there's something magnetic about it. It's not just the design of this car that works, it's that color that works. And I gladly did pay an extra $595 for it. And then luckily this car was fitted with the right interior, the toasted caramel, and this, it's magnificent. However, if there's anything I complain about this car, it's the color of the top. Sadly, this was one of the early production cars, so they weren't doing the tan top at that point. Now they have a, they call it a sand top. That is now an option with the infrared. Then the first option we add would be those wheels, the 21 inch staggered wheels, and they are finished in like a satin finish here with black trim. That is an additional $2,650. The car is fitted with 20s as standard. Then the head-up display. I mean, how many years I've been saying that I'm a sucker for this, so I'd be a fool not to buy it in my own personal car, $900. Then I've been nagging you guys about driving dynamics all these years. So of course we have to go with the Torsen Limited Slip Differential and the Yamaha Performance Damper, 
$460, incredibly well spent on this car. Then the carbon scuff plates, this is a nice touch. So it's basically, it's carbon fiber door sills. They look stunning with the infrared. So I'd say well worth it, $600. Then the touring package, gotta have this, the semi aniline leather, the upper body heat, basically it's a way of putting more heat to the top than the bottom than you would get in most cars. Then the heated steering wheel, the heated windscreen, the Mark Levinson sound system, which is good, it's not the best one I've experienced. And then something, again, I do not like on this car, and I told you in the episode, they put the embossed logo, the Lexus logo in the back of the headrest. I don't like that. Like, I would love to kind of rip those out and put the standard headrests in, because I don't need to tell everybody, hey man, I'm driving a Lexus. This, it, it's just, it's such a unique design, you don't need to call attention with a badge. Uh, is there anything else in that? I believe that is about it, $5,290. Uh, then with that paint, you'd want some paint protection. And this is not like the mop and glow they sell you in the back of the dealership. It's the paint chip. It basically comes from the factory on the front of the car. Uh, so well worth uh, $430. Now, in addition to all of that, this car is fitted with some port installed accessories. First would be the wheel locks, then a trunk mat and a cargo net that all comes together as a $280 package. I would say it's worth it because I have made use of the cargo net. Uh, then we talked about the protective film. There is the option for more protective film at the edge of the doors. Well worth it, because it has saved my ass in scratching the doors and a bargain at 90 bucks. Then the only other thing we add is the destination from Aki or Achi, Japan. My apologies for any mispronunciation there. That is $1,025, which brings us to $113,320. Now, of course, you're probably asking yourself, well, how much did you pay for it? First, bit of fact. Car was in the Toyota fleet for what? Over a year and a half. So it had some miles on it, 10,000 miles to be exact. I've put 900 miles on it in four months. So that's to say this car is not a daily for me. It's more of a toy. Uh, and I don't know yet how long I'm gonna keep it. I'm not gonna sell it right away, but I don't know if it's gonna be like my forever classic car that I will to my grandkids. So I don't know if I wanna tell you how much I paid for it yet, or frankly, I don't know if I wanna tell you at all. But here's what I'm thinking. What I'd like to do is have the ownership experience, understand how much it costs to keep a car like this on the road. Then when I sell it, subtract that amount from what I sold it for, and then share what I paid for it. That brings us to another topic that frankly is a little bit more serious. You guys probably watch a lot of folks that talk about cars on like YouTube or Amazon, wherever you're watching this. And you see the folks say, hey, I bought the cheapest Lamborghini in the world, or I bought the worst Rolls Royce in the country, or I bought a new Ford Bronco or a new Lamborghini. And you know, I see those episodes too. And the majority of those folks are financing those cars. And you guys know how I feel about financing or leasing cars. If you don't know how I feel about debt, click on this link above and that will take you to 17 minutes of me going on and on about car finance and car leasing. But the reality of the situation is, the folks that are saying I'm buying the cheapest whatever, they actually tell you they're financing the cars and I take my hat off to them and God bless them, they can finance their cars. It's not for me to get into their business. But it's the folks that are buying like the Lamborghinis, the Ferraris, the ones that like buy like 10 of them. They're financing those cars and they're not telling you. And I felt it important to come to you guys and say, I wanna share a milestone in my life. This is something that I'm pretty excited about. But I'm not doing it and being counter to the advice that I give you guys. When I say to you, I do not believe in debt, especially on cars, whether it's financing or leasing, I don't. So when I purchased this car, I wrote a check for it. And while we're on the topic of personal cars, this may or may not have been the only acquisition that Kumo and I have had our eye on this year or in the near to medium term. If it may not have been, what do you think we've had our eye on? Let us know in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I wanna say a huge thank you to the folks at Toyota and Lexus that made this whole thing a reality. And more importantly, 
I want to say thank you to you guys because without you guys watching these episodes, sharing these episodes with your friends, and going back and forth in the comments with me, this we wouldn't be standing here having this conversation. So with that, a huge arigato gozaimasu. Until I see you in the next episode, bis später.